Hello, my name is Viktor Öhman, and I'm going to translate this tutorial made by Alexander Maltsev, a brilliant 3D artist from the Baker team. Recently I finished working on the project that you're currently seeing on the screen. After his publication in social networks, I received many positive reviews and even several awards. One of the main tasks that I set for myself was to create an interesting story with assets from the Megascans library and to practice rendering large geometry arrays in Octane. Today, I would like to share my experience, to tell you about how and why I went about making this art. Here are the 10 main parts of the lesson that I will consider. For each of the steps, you could probably make a separate lecture, but will not dive too deep into it. I'll share my experience at the level of my knowledge and skills. I'll talk about the settings for Octane Render, which I usually use in my projects. And at the end of the tutorial, I'll explain why you need a position pass and how it can be useful for compositing. In my work with commercial projects, where the speed is just as important as the quality, the experience has accumulated and I want to share my experience and secrets so that you can apply them in your projects in the future. New projects start with some ideas, inspiration or just a desire to create something new. I like working with details and I decided that in my new projects the characters and environment will be somewhere in the forest and a beautiful render will be supplemented with an interesting story. I found a few suitable mushrooms in the Megascans meadow pack and some very beautiful realistic stones, twigs and tree bark. But I didn't use the grass assets from here though. In this video I'll show you several ways you can get large arrays of procedural plants. I also used the spider character as a hero of the story. I was doing it for another personal project and he continued his life here. This is what the final scene looked like. And despite the result, the scene has some very serious problems with optimization to be honest. I did not consider that when I made it. The scene had too long save times and is too heavy because of the objects with high poly counts. The layers are not named correctly and half of the elements that are present in it are, were not even visible. Everything was done so quickly that I didn't even have time to go back and clean it. I want to emphasize that I only spent three days on this project and if I would have optimized the workflow it would have probably gone even faster. Let's close this scene and do everything from scratch. To know what the magic forest looks like you need to get there somehow or... Right, you could ask Uncle Google about it. Let's try that. Fairy forest macro, we ask and Google immediately gives us some interesting solutions. Some visual images and details start to appear, which I didn't even think about before. For example, these small things here on the plants. And here's a spider sitting on top of a mushroom or on a flower. Maybe some snow or other things that can supplement our scene, like snails for example. But we already have a spider, so we begin by paying attention to the colors in the scene, which would help make the objects and environment more expressive. I really like the photos of Martin Pfizer. The really cool atmosphere, luminous caps of mushrooms, accents in the form of light through leaves, the contrasted backgrounds, juicy colors, and so on. We won't repeat the same picture again, and since we already have some assets from the previous project, let's create something new. I found some interesting references that'll help us generate something from mushrooms, stones and plants, just a little bit differently. The spider web, interesting pieces of wood, and the background is heavily unfocused and everything just looks very macro. Here the spider sits on the mushroom and it's very, very close to our story. It also integrates the protagonist and the mushrooms. The snail, an excellent reference to the details which should be at the foothills, and we may even be guided by them. Open Photoshop and start by defining where we'll have the main action. I think that from the right side there will be a mushroom on which a spider will sit. It won't hang from a web as in the previous work and it will possibly reach for a piece of wood that will lie next to it. I'll try and draw an approximate blocking out and um, make some space for our main objects. Next we'll create more detail. Perhaps later we'll add some colors here and immediately determine where we'll have the light and from which side it will come. 
whether it will be from the background from some source there that will shine behind or from just above or maybe directly from the camera in the center of attention. I think that most likely we'll have something similar to our reference. Here it's very advantageous to see contrast in this space. Let's try and achieve about the same scheme of light as in our reference. Just experiment and try and fill this area with some of our assets. This piece of wood or driftwood. And if nothing interesting happens, then I'll try and play somehow with the composition. Let's try not to pollute the frame and get some more air in there. I'll try and change the position of the object our main character will touch. And around here we'll have our second mushroom and it'll be a little smaller and it's gonna face the one standing next to it. So we'll try and balance the right side with the left side a bit. And since there will be more details uh, in this part, we'll have two smaller mushrooms. We use the rule of triangles to improve the composition. The main objects must not overlap and I think the spider is best to put at the bottom of the edge so that it's hanging. And one of its paws is gonna hold on to the edge of the mushroom like this. And the second paw is gonna try and reach the neighboring one. And it's gonna give a sense of trying to stay and jump to the neighboring mushroom. We have almost everything ready in order to fill the scene with already made objects. And we'll most likely build it right away in 3D without additional modeling, uh, just based on our sketch. When searching for and exporting assets for different engines, Quixel offers Megascans Bridge for free. And so far it's pretty frustrating that there is no Cinema 4D or Octane in the list yet. But we'll choose one that fits the closest, which is the Marmoset Specular Roughness 3D. And this time we'll use the pack with white mushrooms, which will look good on the green background like in the reference. I'll select all that I need to build the scene and the top bottom starts to display the number of assets ready for export. First we will select the highest LOD of the model and the maximum quality of the textures and click on the export button. We'll put everything together in one folder, import it to Cinema 4D and we'll work on the shaders. We can start importing objects into the scene one by one and at the same time we'll most likely encounter a problem with optimization since I chose the highest LOD level in Megascan's bridge. We'll try and do a test render and it will most likely turn out that not all assets will need such a dense mesh. We'll check the number of polygons and when working with Octane Render this can significantly affect the work. Let's start with the stone. We now see that the grid is very dense and contains almost 2 million triangles. It's really impressive considering that there will be a lot of other elements in the scene besides that one. Now we'll try shading it and then import this stone with a less density. And we'll render it to compare and try and understand whether we need this LOD level or not. Let's put in a light source, assign the texture and try to assemble the base shader. Without a connected displacement the stone looks like this. Rotate the light source and connect the displacement map and reduce its value to 1 in order to avoid trouble as this can greatly affect the geometry. It can even make Cinema 4D to freeze. Next, change the parameter medium to half, around 0.5, like this. Displacement does its job, it reveals many details and so you can save this render with a dense mesh. Let's go back into the bridge and export the model at a lower LOD. For example, LOD3. Import it into Cinema 4D and we can see that the stone now has much fewer polygons. But this is before the application of the displacement and normals. Assign the same material with textures that were assigned to the high poly model and copy the light from the previous scene for the same appearance. Considering that the high version has 2 million polygons and this one only has 7000, they look almost the same. You can compare the results and decide quickly for yourself. Is it worth leaving the high poly? And I think the answer is obvious. Since we're on the path of optimization, I say we stay with LOD3 for all the other models as well. And I'm more than happy with that for this project. As you can see, the stone rotates very quickly in the viewport in real time and is rendered really well. Next, proceed to configure the next asset, the mushrooms. Set up the materials, apply a light source with HDRI, and now it looks like this. Let's make the view slightly larger. 
For all mushrooms, one common material is applied and the textures in it look like this. It would be nice if each mushroom had its own separate texture in a larger resolution and not just one as it is now. Create an octane glossy material in order to give the mushroom some reflectance. Using drag and drop we import all associated textures into the node editor. We quickly distribute each of them to their inputs and after applying the displacement maps our geometry changes. Seams are formed almost like it's bursting. After changing the value to around midway uh, you can see small stitches. This is because our geometry is too low poly so the displacement effect doesn't have enough information to make everything go smoothly. There are several ways to solve this problem and I'll use octane tools. I apply the object tag and I switch on level 2 in the subdivide tab. Seams have now disappeared and the number of polygons have increased and the performance has not visually changed. Since the bitmap texture is appointed to an input of a specular I can't control the reflection. I'll try and fix this and modify the shader a bit. I'll detach the texture from the specular and immediately see how the mushroom has become almost a mirror. The first input of the mix node is connected to the bitmap texture and the second input is connected to a white RGB spectrum node. I add the node falloff and send everything to the specular input. Now I have control of the reflection. I'll select the preset of the normal versus the vector of 90 degrees and now it's possible to improve the appearance of the mushrooms, adding some glare so they become more realistic. I'll try and rotate the HDR map at different angles and see how the appearance and reflections of the mushroom changes. By changing the minimum, maximum and falloff parameters in the mix node I can control the reflections from matte to fully mirrored. Since the final image will have a macro effect I'll make an octane camera and adjust it accordingly by blurring the depth of the background. It looks good so let's move on. I'm finally getting closer to the creative part and I'm ready to place all the objects in one scene according to our sketch. But as we can see not all textures are correctly displayed. For example the stone is completely black and it most likely doesn't have any textures at all. This often happens when you import objects into the same scene with textures that are located in different folders. To see exactly what materials have problems like this you can use the octane texture manager. Let's open it. As you can see red crosses here show textures with lost paths. Green check marks on textures that have no problem. Remove the extras so you won't have to repair the materials that are not even applied to any objects. As we change the path to the texture the thumbnail immediately shows the correct texture and the list updates. Also the icon changes to a green check mark and now everything works. Now I quickly fix the paths of the remaining textures and I continue. We update the list and everything works. Now let's see how the scene looks. And we can see that the problem has disappeared on the stone. I usually prefer to have the resolution of the textures in the viewport as high as possible. This has no relation to optimization of course, it just looks better and it all depends on your video card if it's possible for you or not. In order to change the display of the textures in the viewport go to the properties of the material, find the item editor, change the default value of the preview size. Now our stone has become much more beautiful and it's much more pleasant to work with. This already reminds me of the sketch, at least compositionally. It looks organic, the focus of attention is concentrated at this point and it may be necessary to shift everything away from the center. I'll see how it looks after the test render, when more details are to appear. Next we proceed to obtain small plants and moss for the rocks. And there are many ways to scatter objects on the surface of others, such as various plugins and scripts. 
I'll try and use a mix technique and place objects manually using parent tags and I'll also use plugins. I'll start with the biggest stone and try and fill the space around the mushrooms so that it looks natural and seamless and I'll fill the entire adjacent area with some small objects. To do this I'll use the plugin called Ivy Grower. I select the stone, select the point from which we want to grow the plants and press the grow button. Now we can see our splines form near the surface of the stone. It simulates a very natural appearance, but I won't take it too far, so let's stop here. From above I want to add smaller and more diverse other plants. I'll try and use one more plant generator, Forester, this one is called, and now we need to decide what we want to clone. Find the tab with the presets inside the plugin, where you can find a lot of ready-made plants. They are all procedural, and they can be modified at any time. You can add small blades of grass, or long stalks, long spikelets, or some white flowers. Dandelions, by scale, won't fit, but I'll add a few for a variety. Fern we'll use later as an element of the background. Let's go with these green bushes and small red flowers. I'll try and clone them on the surface here on the stone and apply the surface spread plugin. In the general tab, find the object, drag out on the stone here, add a flower as a plugin parent, and it's a bit too dense and not like we want it. Start to configure and reduce the maximum amount to 10, for example. Reduce the size of the flower instance. And cloning occurs on polygons for now, and it's necessary to decide where they will be, uh, more or less, and will most likely determine that they will grow somewhere in the upper part. I'll make a polygon selection and save it. Find constraint in the plugin settings and drag our set to the polygon selection. Change the uh, way of cloning to polygon center, and now it's much more dense. Change the parameter minimum distance, and it affects the distance between clones. And so far it still doesn't look very natural, since the size and angle under which our plants grow remain identical. And we need to add some variety. So let's go into the settings and change the intensity of random scale by 100%. Decrease the base scale a little. I won't make it too dense as we need room for other plants as well. Now you can see that some bushes grow on the slope. It doesn't look very good and there are several ways you can change it. The first is to remove the polygons from the selection or edit the plugin settings we haven't yet considered. Slope. It determines the angle on which clones will be generated. We'll adjust it so that the plants remain at a slant angle. It looks better now and I'll add a few more plants. I want to pay attention to one feature of the Forester plugin. If you need to create several versions of plants, the preset also generates materials for them. And when you create a new version, the materials will be replaced by all plants. To avoid this, when you create a new version of the plant, don't forget to check Include Insert New Materials. This creates a new group of materials which will only belong to this version and won't affect the previous ones. I decided to clone a little more of these green bushes. I copied the spread from the first one and changed the parameters of it to add some variety. I'll speed it up a bit as the process is the same. I'll leave some space to add more plants. I keep in mind that they were on the edge of the stone too. I also want to add some little white flowers so that they stand out from the green. I'll make another duplicate of the surface spread and play with the settings. Let's see how it looks from the camera now. It looks good. Now I'll show one more way of cloning, busying up the fuzz map, which is exported with some Megascans assets. Open the scene with a stone and create the material. In the color I add the fuzz texture. Copy this into the alpha channel and assign it to the stone. Apply the surface spread plugin, find the tab filter by material and drag the new material there. Create an instance that you want to clone. Add a stone in the general objects tab. And I'll reduce the size of the instance. Change minimum distance parameter. Change the polygon to the polycenter. Go back to the filter by material tab and change the intensity to 100%. 
Now we can see that we have a growth activity where, uh, which is influenced by a fuzz texture. You can change the minimum distance parameters to increase the density. This approach is good when you like the result that the texture offers, but I chose to distribute the growth zones manually by selecting polygons. I'll speed up the video now and try to grow a little vegetation here and there on the nearby stones. I'm using a very similar workflow as before. I'll finish messing around with the plants and start adjusting the rest of the assets. Small stones and branches, for example. I, I won't clone it, but instead I'll add them on surface manually in random places. I'll try and simplify the task by applying the constraint tag. Activate clamp. In the target, add our stone, reduce the distance to a minimum, and change target to surface. Now our branch will always remain on the surface of the stone. If necessary, you can change the alignment axis of the object. I copy this tag to all objects that should be on this stone and distribute them on the surface in a random order to look more natural. We'll do the same with the small stones. And since this lesson is mostly improvisation, and the final result is unknown, I rely on reference, experience, and a sense of taste. So our scene now has around 6.5 million polygons. And now we'll end up cloning and multiplying the assets. Next, we'll proceed to setting up the lighting. We still need to improve the materials that are generated after using the plugins. First, they are duplicated, and secondly, they need to be converted to octane. Open the Live Viewer, select the materials and press Convert Material. The script will automatically replace old materials with new ones. Select any of the generated materials and go to the Octane node editor to see the results of the conversion. The script doesn't always work correctly and may need to be edited manually. For example, in the bump we now obviously have wrong textures. I'll fix it and manually reassign it. We'll use the Diffusion bump, normal, and opacity. And we'll also add a subsurface scattering node so that the leaves can be illuminated to look more natural. In the same way as with setting up the materials for the mushrooms, I want to have control over their reflectivity so that the leaves are alive and a little blistered. To do this, we need to make an octane mix material. Add a new glossy material to the second input and add a balance between the first and second material with a float node. We'll adjust it so that it slightly reflects surrounding light. Since we have this plant consisting of two different types of leaves, the first material will be for the young and the second for the more adult and they will differ slightly in color. I will speed up a little and make the same changes for the second leaf. The branches on which the ivy leaves sit will most likely remain with the diffusion material. As a result we got two new mixed materials, one material for the branches and four islands with ivy. Remove the old materials and replace them with new ones. Immediately we'll remove the unused materials and I'll take care of the materials adjustment for the plants which have been made of the surface spread. I'll speed this part up a bit as well. On the transmission input I add a texture from the diffuse and on the input of the medium of each material I add the scattering node. Here we'll finish setting up all the materials and we'll quickly make a visual inspection so that there is no anomalies with textures and we'll proceed to setting up the environment. We'll add light sources, HDR, uh, adjusting the camera and since we haven't tried rendering before we'll perform a test render of the scene. Now 8.5 million polygons for my two GTX 1070 cards, this is not a critical indicator and most likely there will be no problems. The moment of truth! Now we'll try to breathe life into our project and try and render it. There is currently no light source except Octane Sky with an HDR and most likely I'll add some point light sources to highlight some places that need to be emphasized or highlighted. And finally it's time to be creative. Now all the scene objects are loaded into the memory of the video cards and we'll try and see what we get when we switch to the path trace. In total our scene now occupies 4 gigabytes of memory and that's not bad. I'll hide the spider and set it up at the very last. We defined the light direction in the scene would be from the left above uh, and from behind. And the sources is now incorrectly located and we'll try and rotate the HDR to achieve the desired result. And it seems like this is what we need. 
I'll just leave it there. Then I'll add the usual sun to simulate a sunny day on the lawn. Don't forget to tick mix uh, to work with the rest of the light sources. I'll try and change the angle of the sun's rays and I'll focus on the result. Now the IP looks much better. To be honest, I used this plugin for the first time, uh, even though it's been installed for a very long time. I'll continue to customize the materials as the preliminary render show that the mushrooms don't look very good and I need to do something about that. I'll add some softness to the picture using Octane real-time pose effects. Even before setting up materials, I'll add a background plane with a texture. This technique always works well and will give us additional light wrap on the edges of the objects. I create a standard octane material and add this texture to the diffusion and emission channels so that it has a light self-luminosity. I'll try different images as a background to understand what works best. Changing the depth of field in the camera to find a compromise between the small details on the stones and the beautiful optical defocus. I'll further customize the rendering and change the GI clamp parameter, which affects the quality and rendering speed. In my projects, I usually put this coefficient to no more than 3. I'll slightly decrease the hot pixel removal. For initial adjustments of the render, this is enough and I'll continue to configure the materials for the mushrooms. I want to set them up so that there is some subsurface scattering going on. And to do this, first go to the render settings, find the Octane tab and enable the Subsurface Scattering or SSS. Now, in the Live Viewer you can enable only this channel to interactively observe changes in the node scattering. I change the value of density and volume step length to increase the depth of rays penetration. We'll do the same in order to get the reflection pass. We enable it in the settings for the Octane render and in the re reflectivity properties with the help of the falloff node, I adjust the reflection properties. Even if the reflections is not clearly visible in the final render, we'll have a render pass available, which will help reinforce this reflection already in the compositing. I'll add a light glow to the small red and white flowers that we have on the stone, adding the texture that is now assigned to the diffusion into the, the emission channel. Now the light beautifully illuminates the objects, but fairly evenly, and it doesn't give the feeling that it's somewhere in the forest. With the help of a simple design consisting of a random cloning plate, I'll create a lattice, with which is possible to procedurally change the pattern and density of shadows. And the last plant added to the scene will be a fern, which I'll put somewhere behind the stones, and a few of its leaves will fall into the focus zone of the main objects. I want to slightly flatten the difference between the foreground and the flat background. I made a preliminary render in high resolution so that I could look at all the details and see if everything is ok before the final render. I want to add another light that illuminates the lower part of the branches, separating them a bit from the background. And I completely forgot to include our spider hero! The fern branch in the foreground decided not to render at once, but I'll add it to the compositing so that it could be adjusted or can just remove it altogether. And I'll add one more light source on the right so that it lightly illuminates the foot of the mushroom. In projects like this, the most important thing is to know when to stop because adding new objects to the scene can turn the imagination on and you might start adding new elements to the plot and ideas related to some association or references. It's certainly very cool, but to control and optimize the scene becomes more and more difficult. So there's a balance between quality and creativity. And I'm probably going to finish the setup of this scene and go on to tuning the rest of the renders. Object color ID layers for masking the main objects in the scene. The normal's position pass, diffuse direct and indirect passes. Slightly increase the resolution of the picture and turn on the alpha channel so that you can somehow change the background to repaint it or even change it to another. Fire up the render and with the help of some magic editing powers... We can see the results after just one second. Now you can see the ripped edges. This can be disregarded for now since the alpha channel in the viewport may not be displayed correctly. We'll fix this in compositing and everything will be just beautiful. At the moment the progress bar from the bottom shows the progress of the last passes. Wait and when this process is completed just select them and jump into fusion. Compositing is probably the most enjoyable part of the lesson. The passes are still warm off the renderer, 
So we send it to the flow and remove the automatically generated merge nodes. Since the rendering was done in a linear color space, when importing into Fusion, the brightness of the image doesn't seem to be the same as we planned. And to work with it correctly, we need to convert it to uh, the color space Rec709 or sRGB. And we'll use the built-in Fusion tools and switch the lookup table. Set it to sRGB and the picture is already much more similar to the one we set up in Cinema. The edges are still ripped. So let's see what we have in the import tab. Check pass multiply by alpha channel. And now the edges are pre-multiplied and they already look much better. Let's throw a background image in here and let's use the one we use in cinema. This is a common bitmap image and it's in the color space of sRGB. So for our project, it needs to be converted into linear since we have already decided to work in that color space. For this, I apply the standard gamut tool. If I import a bitmap image without a changed color space into a linear, we get this overexposed and overcontrasted image. If I change the input to sRGB, we get a result closer to the original. Drop it into the window without using the lookup table. This is a picture and I won't change it. Here's the image translated into linear space, and here it is without using the lookup table in its original sRGB color space. Now I can work with a bitmap picture. Add it as a background. We flip it, uh, add some unfocus to it, and let's change the shape of the bokeh. As in the octane render, um, and I'll leave it that way. Then maybe go back to the depth of field settings again. We'll continue to make improvements using render passes. The SSS pass just somehow didn't work out, and that's why I'll leave this pass alone. It turned out unsuccessful, noisy, and not informative. I can try and make this effect in a different way, but in the form in which it is now, it just doesn't work. At least not for the mushrooms. Why do you need a position pass, you may ask? Perhaps it's not useful, but I want to show you that you can use it in a very convenient way as a relight tool. For example, we need to highlight some parts of the hat of the mushroom, and instead of drawing the mask manually and then animate it, we can just open the tools, find the group named position, and apply the effect of the volume mask. Now go into the channels and send the RGB information to the X, Y, Z. The yellow triangle is the entrance to the position pass, and you can submit any picture to the green input. So how can this be useful to us? Well, in the color tab, we'll specify the mask only, and in the shape tab, we draw out the coordinates of the space that we are interested in for correction. For example, here under the mushroom head. Reduce the size to get the zone of interest. We can soften it, and most interestingly, we can now make this mask even for the foot of the mushroom. It really has a position in space. We open the position tab and try to move it along the x-axis. Here is information we now have in the alpha channel. We can move this mask to the depth of the z-axis as well. We spent a couple minutes and we have a mask attached to the surface of a particular object and this method even works for animation. It's enough to allocate a space of a place of interest in the scene with a pipette and the mask will follow it in space. This tip is used by very few people, but sometimes it saves a lot of time. For example, here is a zone that I want to darken a bit for accentuating the place where the mushroom's hat meets the foot. So I take the color correction tool and use the input of the correcting mask and volume mask tool. 
I'll play with the settings and then darken and tint the uh, selected area a bit. So how do you apply normal maps? This is a very useful pass and there are many ways to do it. I often use it to add extra reflectance and small highlights. Of course it could be obtained right away in the render, uh, adding light sources to the scene. But if that's not possible, I try and make such corrections in the compositing phase. And it saves a little time. Now I'll quickly show this technique. We need to install the Sapphire plugin. And in the light group we'll find the light 3D effect. A dark background added into the yellow input and a normal pass added to the green. If I move this pointer you can see how the reflection on the objects are changing. The light source not only has X and Y coordinates but it can also move in the depth. So with the Z position slider we can rotate it and see how the light source is moving towards us or away from us, showing some new faces that may be interesting. Perhaps we can add a thin specular on the hat because it looks unnatural and dry. Look here, some kind of highlight showed up on the rocks too. And on the mushroom this flare looks odd, we'll most likely be masking that out. Now the accent lighting focuses the center as we planned, and we didn't do any vignettes or any additional color corrections for this. On the right, here, is the dark part. It's the least of all attention, and due to the directional light source in the cluster of objects, your eyes are concentrated at this point. Perhaps now we'll artificially add depth of field to this part, since there are too many details on it that attract too much attention. You can of course make a mask and darken it a little from this side. You can apply a vignette, but this is the last thing you need for compositing and color correction, since a vignette is an optical defect and I don't want to use it for now. The depth of field will be made artificially, as the mushroom and these flowers are at the same distance from the camera. They shouldn't be blurred, but I still think that will look odd. And now we try to reduce a little bit of this information with depth of field. I'll use a fresh left depth of field and draw a custom depth of field map. The usual bitmap node, in which the higher the brightness, uh, the stronger the unfocus is. It looks nice and it doesn't feel as if this edge goes too deeply. Now I'll work on the bokeh shape and try to add more unfocus to this edge. We're close to finishing and the last thing I want to do now is to adjust the spider. It doesn't require a significant retouch, just make it a bit juicier and brighter. In projects like this, which are very rich in details, this can take a very long time, but I suggest you stop at this stage. Of course, you can still change the composition solution or add or remove objects from the scene, and everything will depend only on you and your imagination and patience. Since the picture is rendered in high resolution, you can improve, for example, the spike to finish it separately. And you can polish every element in this composition this way. But as a result of this improvisation lesson, I consider this an acceptable result. A little tip. If you want to make a beautiful project, don't try and do everything in one day. Do as much as you can and sleep on it. In the morning you're gonna see a lot of imperfections and get many new ideas that will improve your work. We have reviewed the workflow with the material for Octane Render, tried to use the assets from the Megascans catalog, learned how to grow plants in many different ways, and I spent quite a bit of time setting up the light and environment, and the fusion node tree reminds me of a beginner compositor, because the correction was almost not required to the final render result. And I think, now with all the modern graphics software, it's very hard to get a bad result. All you need is regular practice. If digital art is a door to another world, then it seems to me that with Octane Render, Cinema 4D and good imagination, you just don't open it, you can knock that door out with your foot. I hope this tutorial was interesting and that you found something useful for yourself. This is Victor Eman, 
translating for Alex Meltsev, and I'll see you again. Thank you.